Let's welcome today's guest, Boxing Day. Good evening. Welcome to the Salem Area Mass Transit District's uh, June board meeting. It is June 23rd, 2022, a little after 6.30 p.m. and we're here at Courthouse Square, just south of the Downtown Transit Center. We'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. And um, Ms. Galeazzi will note the attendance for us and then we'll go ahead and proceed to do the Pledge of Allegiance, which I will lead us in. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next, I will ask General Manager Pollock uh, to lead us in the safety moment. All right, thank you. For this safety moment, I'm going to ask Karen Garcia, our Security and Emergency Preparedness Manager, to present it. Thank you. Um, good evening, President Davidson and members of the board. It's been a while since we were all in this room together in person, so I'm happy to see everyone this evening. It's a good time for us to refresh the emergency priorities and procedures for this room because safety is a high priority for chariots. So first I'd like to share about the two alerting systems that we have. Number one is a fire alarm. Our fire alarm in this building has both an audible enunciator and strobes. So if there is a fire emergency and the system activates, we will hear an alarm which will indicate a full evacuation is required. The second system is a public addressing system or an announcement system. We use this system internally to announce different types of emergencies that are not fire related where we need to communicate to every occupant of the building, whether that's to do an evacuation or shelter in place, regardless of what the situation is, we have that tool available to us as a communication to everyone. There are two emergency exits from this room. The first and primary is to your left, my right, through the doors that you probably came through. And then once you hit the main lobby, you'd turn left and exit out on Court Street. The second exit is out the back of this room to your right. Once you exit out that room, you just continue straight down the hallway and there's an exit door that will deliver you out onto Church Street. So that would be your secondary exit. Um, we would ask in the event of an evacuation that you proceed directly outside. If by chance you're parked underneath the building in the garage, um, we really don't want people staying in the structure if there's an emergency. So please don't run downstairs to get in your car to evacuate. Just get outside into safety as quickly as possible. Once outside, we ask everyone to proceed to our assembly point, which is on the north block. That's the white sidewalk along Chemeketa Street on the other side of the transit center bays. Um, we would stay out there until an all clear is sounded. Even if the alarm stops going off, we would not re-enter unless an all clear had been called. In the event of an earthquake, we would do what we do in any other place, drop cover and hold on. Um, get to a place where you would be um, free from falling objects, objects from above. Um, once the quake stops, we would not encourage you to evacuate unless it's clearly unsafe to do so. Just stay in the building and we'll reassess from there if we need to take further action. 
If there's a medical emergency, we would use the 911 local service. If you're using your cell phone, obviously you would just call 911. If you're using one of the building phones, you have to dial 9 first to get an outside line. So it would be 9 911. The address for this room would be 555 Court Street, Northeast, Senator Hearing Room on the first floor. Um, sometimes this building is a little confusing to the Willamette Valley Call Center because our phones here are connected to the courthouse. Mm -hmm. So it's always best to share the address where you are so that we can get an emergency response to the correct location. Um, if you need special assistance in the event of an evacuation, definitely speak up. We won't leave anyone behind. Um, so we're happy to provide assistance. And um, I think that concludes my safety moment unless there's any other questions. All right, I don't see any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next, um, I'll note a potential change in the agenda. Um, I may be moving the budget hearing to later in the meeting if our uh, budget committee chair is not able to join us just yet. Um, so I'll, we'll call that right after public comment. But um, for now, we'll go ahead and proceed to public comment and see if any members of the public, either in person or virtually, would like to provide public comment. Please. Sure. I'm John Hamill, the president of the local chapter of the American Council of the Blind. No, I'll, I'll just stand here. It's only three minutes. <laughs> and uh, first, I want to say it's good to be meeting in person again. I've attended a number of these board meetings. Hey, President Davidson. I've pardon the interruption. I can't hear if oh, we have yes. somebody at the microphone. I apologize. Thank you for flagging that, Director Carney. Um, yes, it's good that, to be meeting in person again. I attended a number of these meetings virtually, but I found it all too easy to be truant. So if you have to go to the effort to actually be here, it's a lot easier to pay attention. So good for us. Second, um, I'd like to say how much uh, we in the disabled community appreciate the chariot service, especially over these last two years with COVID. We had some members of the chapter whose death, domestic situation was less than ideal, and they were going crazy trying to stay home all the time. If they couldn't use chariot's lift to get out and have coffee with us and vent every week, who knows what they'd been. So thanks for your service during these last two years. And lastly, uh, it's clear that Salem and Kaiser are continuing to grow, both in terms of population and in terms of um, new developments in, uh, in peripheral parts of the city. And it's clear that transit is going to have to adapt and evolve to meet those changing situations. And as that goes on, speaking on behalf of all disabled people and just seniors generally, one of the things that would be really great if uh, you could consider that would be putting the bus stops closer together. Right now we have a quarter mile uh, standard for those stops and that actually is a disincentive for people with disabilities and older people to use the scheduled service and, and tends to drive them to chariots lift which is more expensive both for the traveler and also for the transit district. So uh, that, that last mile or first mile of getting from home to the stop and from the stop back home uh, is a bit of a barrier. So if, uh, if the board can find a way to get those stops closer together, it, uh, would, be, uh, it would be removing a barrier for us. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for your public comment. You bet. Are there other members of the public that would like to provide comment at this time? Ross, anyone on virtually? No one is okay. raising their hand on me. Perfect. Okay. Um, 
Is Chair Lincoln by chance on? No, okay. We'll go ahead and proceed to the consent calendar. And so unless there's any issues or questions around the items on the consent calendar, I would entertain a motion to approve them. Move to approve the consent calendar. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Second. And a second. Any discussion on the motion? I, I will offer one piece of discussion. Just wanted to say that um, it's wonderful that we continue to support the uh, United Way of Mid Willamette Valley with the annual allocation of the day passes. Well, not just the United Way, the many nonprofits in our community through that program. So just wanted to um, express gratitude for those that help facilitate that process. President Davidson, thank you for the comment. I was unclear looking at my packet if that was going to be discussed separately, but I also wanted to make comments on the United Way past donations that Chariots has historically participated in. Um, so maybe if it's not too late, I could Please. ask a question or two. Yeah. Go thank ahead. Thank you. Um, and my, my question was, do we have any idea of how successful our donation through the United Way is? Is there any way for us to track or know um, how many of the passes are actually used? I think that was included in our board packet. Yes. Uh, page 18, I believe. Page 18 through uh, 20 for our statistics and uh, little stories of uh, some of the people who've been served by the bus pass program. I can tell you uh, the program is way uh, oversubscribed, meaning there's a greater need than the passes we even provide. Uh, and we have bumped that up over the years. Uh, it, just since we're talking about it, so the way that the program works is we donate the passes to the United Way they have a, a set of member uh, organizations who apply to the United Way for bus passes for their, their clients. Uh, and the United Way distributes those uh, uh, to those member agencies. And part of the process, they, they, the member agencies then uh, provide uh, uh, data and feedback to the United Way, which you can see in the report. Uh, and, uh, we, and we can track uh, the day passes, especially when we go to electronic fairs, the number of times a day pass gets used. But uh, there, if we gave them 10,000, it wouldn't be enough. Uh, but we're trying to do, do a little bit. Now, the United Way does from time to time uh, get grants from the city of Salem and other places, and they'll buy even more, pa they'll buy passes in addition to these. And we, we, we provide them at a 25% discount uh, for nonprofits. That's really great detail. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm just, I'm glad we're having the conversation because if there is anyone that's a member of the public that's listening, I just think this is such a, um, an important service, both that United Way is providing and a, a great illustration of the kind of opportunities that transit can provide. Um, to our nonprofit community and to our community in general. So appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Director Carney. Um, and later in the meeting, I'll, I'll address something that might make these bus passes go a little bit further, hopefully. Um, so remind me and I'll, I'll bring that back up. So uh, we do have a motion on the table, though. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? None opposed. Okay, motion passes unanimously. And we'll go ahead and, no Chair Lincoln still? Okay, we'll go ahead and proceed to the action items. Um, the first is to accept the South Salem Transit Center Mobility Hub site selection report. I will. Okay. Okay. 
contestant? Yeah. Nice. Okay, great. Good evening, President Davidson, member, members of the board. Uh, it's good to be here in person. It's, it's, uh, it's been a long time. So uh, tonight we want to bring to you uh, the final uh, report for the site selection study for South Salem Transit Center. This process started in January of 2021, and we've brought uh, a couple of updates to you during the, the key phases of this process. Um, and tonight, uh, Ryan Farncomb from Parametrics will be bringing the report and presenting the, the findings of the report to you. Uh, the only part of the staff report that I really want to cover in any detail are the next steps before I turn it over to uh, Ryan to present the, the uh, findings of the report. So after tonight, uh, where we have a, a recommendation of, of a short list of sites, um, there, this, as we mentioned earlier, there will be an opportunity then next month for the board to consider of those three sites, uh, which would be the preferred site. So that will come before the board in July. Uh, and we will be looking for the board to take action on that at that point. Uh, we are also in the process right now of preparing the solicitation for uh, what it will take next uh, to be able to get ready for construction. And that is uh, design, engineering, uh, assistance with going through the process of purchasing property. Uh, we had to complete uh, an environmental study of the site. And then we also have to have, uh, when you purchase property with federal transit funds, you have to do an appraisal. And then you have to have a separate firm do a review of that appraisal to make sure that they followed uh, the rules. And then FTA has to concur with that as well. Then we go through the process. And this is the fun part of the process where we get into the actual design. We've seen conceptual designs. And Ryan will talk a little bit about that. Uh, but this is where we start getting into, well, what is the reality going to be? What is it that we want to? And at, early in the stages, it's easy, easy to get into that, like, how many benches do we want? Well, what kind of shelters do we want? What color do we want it to be? How many, you know, that's where we start to get into this process. And this process involves a lot of input from and involvement from staff, uh, the board, and also the public, because that is an important aspect of, of this process. Then finally, we bring this uh, final product that they will produce to the board um, and look for your agreement for what we're, what we're carrying forward. And finally, the results of that will be the documents we need to go out to bid for construction. And that will be the, the next process. We get our permits, we build it, and then we have the most enjoyable part of a project, which is the ribbon cutting and grand opening and going into service. So this is uh, what we have ahead of us. Of course, there's steps in there involving funding and steps, a lot of steps along the way. But that is a, a summary of the, the next steps. So I'd like to turn it over now to Ryan Farncombe from uh, Parametrics. Ryan uh, Farncombe and Alicia McIntyre have been working with us uh, over this uh, full duration of the project and have done a fantastic job for us, as well of, as other members of their team who have supported them in this effort. So with that, Ryan. Thanks, Steve, and, and thank you, everyone, for your time tonight. Can everybody hear me? We can. OK, great. Sorry I'm not able to be there tonight in person. Let me pull up the presentation here just one sec. OK, and I'm going to minimize this uh, Zoom. So if uh, I miss a question or a hand raise, please uh, interrupt me. Um, but thanks again for your time tonight. I think last time uh, we talked to you about this project, my colleague Alicia was here uh, a few months back. Um, but we wanted to give you a, kind of a rundown of, of where we're at uh, here at the end of the project. Briefly review um, the candidate sites that uh, have emerged from this process. Um, review the public engagement that we conducted during, um, during this effort, and then uh, cover next steps, which Steve has already largely covered, but I'll breeze through them at the end as well. 
So um, we had previously presented to you some prototypical designs for a transit center. Um, what we have done in the interim period in the last few months is implement a multi-level site selection process. So multi-level meaning we conducted an initial fatal flaw analysis to look at the areas of interest in South Salem uh, that we knew we wanted to look at and eliminate a lot of the ones, a lot of the sites that we knew just wouldn't work right off the bat. From the sites that emerged from that fatal flaw analysis, we conducted another level of screening uh, to really hone in on those sites that are gonna best meet the needs of the agency. Uh, and also just from a practical standpoint, uh, serve the transit center, uh, you know, making sure the zoning is in place that we need to be there and that the site is the proper size to uh, accommodate the kinds of uh, uh, amenities we're looking for at the site. And so just to briefly remind you of those prototypical designs, here is one of the, of, um, the transit center and mobility hub. And I think it's important to note here and I, I believe we noted this last time as well, that this is really the kind of full build of this facility. And this is about three and a half acres uh, as laid out here in terms of the site size. But, um, you know, this facility is very scalable depending on um, costs and the site available, uh, a lot of different factors. So what we wanted to do though, is start from what is the kind of idealized site We also looked at um, a notion called super stops, which is uh, separate but related to this effort um, to site the transit center. Uh, we wanted to develop these super stops, which are really kind of enhanced bus stops, uh, typically they'd be placed on the arterial network, um, because these could serve as uh, transfer nodes as well that complement uh, a transit center. So here are um, some of our site selection criteria. As you can see, we looked at a lot of different things. I won't run through all of these, um, but a few that I wanted to point out, land use and zoning were obviously very important. We've had discussions with the city of Salem several times um, to understand uh, the, the city has been going through an update to their comprehensive plan and zoning codes. So we wanted to make sure we understood how things are changing in this corridor. Um, we also wanted to obviously look at how uh, a site would accommodate transit operations. Um, you may remember a year ago or more when we first talked to you about this project, we, we did some initial analysis to look at the transit network in South Salem and understand how it might um, change in the future to work with a transit center. So as we kind of use this funnel to get down to our, our sites of interest, um, we really narrowed in on Commercial Street south of Coopler. Um, one of the final criteria we looked at in earnest was uh, ease of site acquisition um, for these, these, these properties. And that resulted in three candidate sites that um, you may have read about already in the, the final report. And I also just wanna note one more time here again that this transit center and mobility hub facility is highly scalable depending on the property chosen, the, the financial constraints, uh, et cetera. So here's the site locations. This is um, Coopers uh, a little bit just north uh, off the screen here, but these sites are generally uh, on commercial in the vicinity of Wiltsey. Um, those three, eight D and F are the, the three candidate sites this study has landed on. And uh, this was probably a little difficult to see depending on how big the screen is in front of you. But these are also, I should mention, also in the final report. But uh, what we did was develop, basically take that prototypical design we developed and apply it to each of these candidate sites to make sure that uh, the transit center would work on these uh, locations. Uh, and then we actually also vetted these concept designs with the city of Salem to see if they had any immediate concerns or, or, or things like that that we should note. So this is one potential conceptual design um, here uh, at site eight at the northeast corner of Wiltsey and Commercial. And I'm just gonna keep moving here. 
and then this is across the street on the northwest corner of Wiltsey and Commercial. Um, as you can see, the, the site uh, previous is vacant. This site does have um, several existing structures on it. And then the third candidate site is just north of here um, and uh, near Fabry and Commercial. Uh, and you can see the, the layout there. And again, there are also uh, existing structures on this site. So each of these sites uh, presents opportunities and constraints and, and trade-offs. Um, as part of our due diligence work, we sent uh, our uh, environmental scientists and engineer out to each site to kind of uh, get the lay of the land and, and uh, make sure there wasn't anything missing that, you know, you know things pop up that you can't see in an aerial, right? Um, the, and again, we also talked to the city of Salem. In particular, we were interested in understanding if there were any immediate um, traffic concerns. And uh, the site at Fabry uh, actually presents um, the most challenges with regard to traffic and access, uh, but they are not insurmountable. Um, and our final recommendation is to advance all three of these sites as viable candidate locations um, to, to give charity. We believe that each of these sites would serve the needs of the transit uh, facility. Um, and they present uh, options for chariots to move forward with. And the last thing I wanted to mention here is that we are developing construction cost estimates uh, for each site. I apologize that those weren't ready uh, for this presentation tonight, um, but we have had to take some extra time uh, to develop these cost estimates and make sure they're as dialed in as we can get them at this very conceptual level of design. The major issue we're wrestling with right now is uh, inflation has um, really affected the construction industry. Um, bids are coming in on some projects two or three times what the engineer's estimate is. And so we're getting all the information we can from recent projects to get the most realistic cost estimate possible. So uh, again, sorry those aren't ready tonight, but we will pr we'll provide those to uh, staff here in coming days. And now I just wanted to briefly go through some of the public engagement that we conducted as part of this project. Um, we have a project website that we've regularly updated, SouthSalemTC.org. Earlier on in this process, we did a statistically valid survey of South Salem residents and businesses. We've had uh, an online open house and surveys. We have talked to the Citizens Advisory Committee several times. And then uh, Chariots has done a great job getting, uh, the, getting the word out. Um, online notification, materials on buses, social media posts. Uh, we've sent hundreds of, or maybe thousands of postcards, I forget offhand. And when we did our initial demographic analysis, um, we found that Spanish was the most likely language uh, in addition to English spoken in the project area. So we've done both English and Spanish materials throughout this process. And here's just a couple examples of some of those uh, engagement materials. Here's a social media post. So in terms of responses, we received nearly 600 survey responses uh, total. And I think it's notable that half of those respondents uh, use chariots regularly. Uh, the responses were really helpful in understanding the kinds of amenities uh, that folks are looking for at a transit center. Um, we did have nearly 1,500 page views of the online open house. We often report page views because a lot of times folks will just kind of check out the project. They may not fill out a survey, but they've uh, they've visited our page to digest the information. And so we want to track that. Uh, and as I mentioned, we've coordinated with the city of Salem throughout this. Our last phase of outreach um, really closes the loop with the public. We posted that final report to the website, which is kind of the culmination of all this work to to make sure that the public understands where this study has landed. So as Steve has, has mentioned, this study is now very nearly complete. Um, we have just a couple of things left to do, one of them being cost estimates. And uh, the next steps from here uh, are, are really choosing that final site, um, site and negotiations with the property owners. 
uh, continued outreach throughout this process. Environmental review is going to be important as is local permitting and then advancing the design through 30, 60 and 90% and, and final and then uh, finally getting to construction. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Steve, I'll turn it back to you. Right. Uh, we are uh, at the point here where I will make the staff recommendation, then we can have some questions. So staff recommends the board accept the South Salem Transit Center Mobility Hub Site Selection Study Final Report and approve the rec recommendations of the sites identified in the report as finalist sites to proceed with the required steps for property acquisition. Thank and you. For entertain any questions? Questions. Please. Thank you, President Davidson. Uh, so one question I had is I seen that when you were doing, uh, you were showing us the, the screenshots of the, um, the social media post that uh, it looked like they were from, they were in English from here. I couldn't really tell because the, the screen was kind of small. But has there been any effort um, noting that the second most spoken language is Spanish in the area um, to do Spanish posts on social media? It, but those posts, uh, posted actually, uh, they were in Spanish as well. And it was a little hard to see there. But the English language block was up, up top and then the Spanish language block was right below it. Beautiful, thank you. I have a, a handful of questions. I'll maybe start off with one. Um, so the initial assumptions included that Route 6 frequency would not be uh, increased. And I'm, I guess I'm making some assumptions. Uh, if, if, if that were to change, say around 2026, when you know this transit center mobility hub is perhaps operational, would that change any of the analysis, the ultimate conclusions here? I am assuming no, but I want to pose the question. President Davidson, members of the board, we uh, have taken in that into consideration and, and really one of the important aspects of adding a, a transit center mobility hub at the, um, what I will call the outer end of a service area, is it really presents then the opportunity to reshape how that area is served. So currently for us to attempt to gain some level of coverage, we just continue to stretch our main routes that come downtown and we stretch them further and we wind them around a bit at the end and we end up with not the most effective or efficient trips for people who are uh, reside in those areas or need to access uh, their destinations in that area. So it creates a challenge and this addition of this facility will present then the opportunity for our planning department to really look at how we utilize the available service hours that we have that is currently serving those areas or any additional that we would have through opportunities like the stiff funding and so forth to then uh, put together routes that only operate in the south end of town and create that coverage that we have to increase frequency. We may look at how Route 6 operates right now. It is one of those that is, uh, I call it the extreme version of taking a route and stretching it as far as you can and really not operating as effectively and efficiently as we, we could. And because we had to stretch it so far, we had to drop the frequency so far down because of financial constraints, which, which we know that frequency is one of the, the best aspects of, of viable transit as, a, as an alternative. So having this facility and locating it, it out closer to the areas where not only do we know there's need today, but it's also an area with opportunity and, and potential for continued growth. It then gives us the opportunity to create another anchor point for service to emanate out of. And then we also remind us that we use the term transit center mobility hub. This also is intended to create the, uh, a nexus point for not just large fixed route bus service to come together, but also other modes, smaller, uh, what we call micro transit, micro mobility, uh, car share, even opportunities for transportation network companies to be able to drop off or pick up if that is that's your way of cho choice, and or even regional service can make a connection at that point without having to 
only go all the way downtown. So this really opens up a world of opportunities to better serve uh, the south end of our service area. So to, to pin you down on that, it would not change the ultimate outcomes of the three site recommendations if the six was to all of a sudden be a 30 or 15 minute headway. I really don't think it would because I think ultimately, even if we change the frequency of that to a 30 or 6, 15 minute headway route, route six itself just by how long and mm -hmm. the, the design itself is not terribly efficient right. and not a good design for that I would envision that, and that, this is, don't hold me to this, but that's up to our planning department, but I envision that route six ultimately, especially once this is constructed, will change significantly mm -hmm. and probably become something very different than what you see it is today because the areas that we're trying to serve by stretching the end of it will be served in a much more effective and customer friendly way. Okay, great, thank you. Director Duncan. All right, uh, so one of the notes is that Kubler is a difficult place to add additional stops. Um, in the last couple weeks, there is an announcement that in addition to the new Costco, we also are going to have a couple more uh, businesses going in in that area and the down the road they're developing. So moving forward, although it is a difficult place to make stops, do we have a plan to include them anyway? <laughs> well, part of the challenge with Kubler itself, especially along that segment, is it's classified as a parkway. It is not classified as an arterial or a, or a collector under traffic, traffic engineer standards. And under that classification, there are limitations, specific limitations of the types of amenities and functional design that you can have along that alignment. Now, for the area that you're talking about that's being developed for Costco, there's uh, medical clinics over there, uh, there are, there's uh, multifamily housing, there's already single family housing and continued development. There are other, though, parallel routes that we can look at. So uh, I believe it's 27th, which comes back to, um, I don't remember if it's, it's the next street that parallels Kubler that runs behind Costco. And so there is opportunity there. And I know our planning department has looked at that. Uh, one of the things that has been helpful is they are adding a signal there at the, at the name of the street. I can't remember the, cross street, but the one that comes around behind the, the Salem Clinic and PT Northwest and that development and then continues down past Costco. Because there's a signal there, now it will be a viable option to utilize that safely while service can make turns without being at risk of having to cross traffic unsafely. In the past, that was a challenge because, well, one, it wasn't developed, so there wasn't as much of a need, and two, not having the ability to cross a very busy thoroughfare safely with a, a full-size transit bus, they don't accelerate real fast. Um, you really need to have that. Now that that is being developed for higher volumes of traffic, controlled traffic movement, it, it's a much more viable option. Just pressing on that a little bit more, this is not, this is not an announced area, but prior to, so like 2008, the property caddy corner to that, to the Costco had originally been slated for a Kubler station that developer still owns that land. It's the same land that um, had a bunch of white oaks that were illegally cut down in that area. If that were to develop, whether it be a Kubler station or something else, probably in the next so many years, is that also something that we're taking into account, which would, again, require crossings, or is this something that maybe we need to talk to the city about? I don't, I don't even know what reclassifying would even look like, but there's a lot of development projects along that route, and I just want to... Yeah. What do we need? What what can I do to help us? To yeah. keep, keep that I don't in mind? think you will ever see them reclassify Cooler just because of traffic volumes that travel through there. That the reason it's designed that way is to keep traffic moving so that you don't have lots. It's part of it is the access control, so you don't have lots of places where people are turning and so on. We are aware of not only that development. I know our planning department gets notification of every single development that is in the works. Everything from somebody who wants to build a garage off the back of their house to full-fledged development. And they do provide comment. And I know that um, when we did our last changes, we actually had intended to bring transit up to Battle Creek and to come up that way rather than the way we do right now down on 
Charleston and to Kubler and around. The challenge was Reed Road at the time was too narrow for two 40-foot transit buses to pass safely at 45 miles an hour with no shoulder. Um, as the development continues in that whole area, in the old Fairview pro property and the, that Battle Creek area, they are also making the improvements to those roadways where that is now a viable option as well. So I know our planning department has a lot of that on their radar. And when I talked about uh, this creating an anchor point, that opens up all those areas that we've been looking at and have been a bit challenged in how do we serve them. So by having a route uh, that would circulate from the South Sonoma Transit Center Mobility Hub, but not have to go all the way downtown, the amount of time that you have then gives you a much better ability to circulate in a meaningful way through some of these areas that we see developing. The other area that this is uh, an important aspect for is connecting to the South Lancaster Mill Creek Corporate Center area and making that connection across, which is another one of the important aspects of this development. So following this and building the site, and even as we're leading up to it, our planning department will be doing extensive work and evaluation, and I'm sure they will be bringing lots of ideas to you as well on how this happens. Uh, this will be just one piece of that puzzle of how we do a better job of providing that level of service that we need to see in that part of our, our service area. Mr. Dickey, I think you said the word planning department three times, so uh, Mr. French is on, has appeared. There he is. Uh, Mr. French, would you like to add anything? I think it's you have to say it three times and then he appears. Yeah. Uh, no, I just wanted to, I'll, I'll state that um, with this transit center, knowing exactly where it is, we were looking at kind of current conditions and trying to kind of plan. But as we have honed in, the planning department has really been looking to, to figure out how this works with how we serve the whole entire area, how we serve Kubler Boulevard. Yes, Kubler Boulevard directly on it, but we've been looking and we presented um, probably two years ago to the board or a year and a half ago, the Kubler Link idea, and that's still in the plans. Those are things that we're looking at every day and trying to address how we uh, implement service to better serve that area. So. Uh, Kubler, I mean, we've been responding to many uh, land use applications uh, around the Costco area, uh, down close to the state uh, police office. Uh, there's roads that the city are, is uh, proposing or looking at, and we're very involved in that process to, to try to figure out how we're going to put transit. So uh, figuring out which one of these sites our, is the location and then we really dig deep into how we alter and we talk about numbers route 6 or route 21 or route 8. I would caution on using any of those because it may not be route route 6 is a route that was formed because of meeting the needs of the community at a time but it, it didn't really it it just barely met the needs or provided service, but it didn't truly meet the needs. So as we go forward and develop this transit center, we can really look at how we serve South Salem and how we connect uh, South Lancaster to South Commercial without having that long downtown trip. So um, this, is, this gives us an anchor point really to jump off from. Thank you. Director Carney. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, okay, first of all, what an amazing report. There is so much information in here. I feel like I could sit with it for a week and still not really um, not be able to recite it all the way probably can. Um, I mean, just table two one with the proposed service alterations is kind of mind blowing. And I have to go back and forth between the service map to really even understand what it means. Um, can you talk a little bit about the staff recommendation that we keep all three sites and any, like, is there, is there a cost to pursuing multiple, um, opportunities at once? And I believe, am I wrong in thinking that the Walmart site is in the final three? but that we have already, 
it's, it's noted in the report that there was an unsuccessful acquisition attempt in the past for that location. So I'm just, maybe I'm just getting confused as I'm trying to read through this. So I'll, uh, Director Carney, I'll respond first to the, the last question. Uh, the, the Walmart site is not in the consideration. That is something that was a determination right at the beginning of this, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, the reason we're bringing all three sites is there are pros and cons, but the, we ultimately wanted to bring them to the board to have the opportunity to, to consider the number of factors. Cost is one of those things. Relocation is one of those things of, of, other, of other businesses. Uh, anytime you do work of this nature with uh, federal transit funds, you are obligated to abide by what's known as the Universal Relocation Act, which if you are relocating businesses, then you are obligated to uh, pay for their expenses for that. So that is something that will be considered in, the, in that presentation. Uh, that's what we are intending to do during the work session and the board meeting next month is to bring the criteria that identifies the pros and cons of each of these sites and then allow the board to come to a final decision of what would be the preferred site for us to pursue. Um, to begin the formal negotiation process and to go even beyond that, we would, we would naturally start with the top priority site and go down that path. And if, unless there was some reason that that would not work out, we would not continue to pursue the other two sites. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, that's great. And then I, we talked earlier in the presentation um, about cost increases as they relate to inflation and supply chain and who knows what's next. Um, and there is also, I think table two, two has the, both the improvements that are in place and those that are proposed. And I know um, later this week, or maybe it's, I think it's next Tuesday, we have our SCATS policy committee meeting where we're taking on exactly that topic, all of the things that we potentially won't be able to afford to do as a result of cost increases. And so I'm wondering what kind of vulnerability does this very dynamic um, sort of like pricing and cost situation that we're in put the transit district in because I know that sometimes we get into these, um, you know, funding allocation relationships where we need to spend money by a certain time. And if you can't get the work done or you can't get the supplies, um, then you can't get it done. And if the cost goes up so high that you can't get it done for another reason, I'm just, I'm, I'm hoping to understand a little better and, and it may be unfair. I mean, you're not fed, so <laughs> I don't know quite how to answer that, but it does give me um, some concern to be thinking about such a big capital project um, on this timeline, given our present circumstances. Yes, yeah, so those are definitely legitimate concerns, Director Carney. Um, one of the things, well, I, I'll first start off with, and in my 25 plus years in the transit industry, this is the most volatile I have ever seen pricing for not just materials, but also labor and as well as supply chain issues uh, be, being a major factor. Uh, we're seeing con construction projects, and this is not just limited to us. This is our other public agency partners are seeing incredible, incredibly high costs come in for, for bids. As a result of that, in our scope of work for the design factor, we have made it very, very clear that we do intend for this to be a scalable design, scalable on more than one occasion, more than one aspect. One of those aspects would be in or out period uh, items or aspects of the, the project that we just realized we are not going to be able to include. Some of that could also be because of space constraints. Um, the other would be the, what I would call, we will build it when we can afford it approach as well. And some of those elements, we can also have them design components. So for instance, um, 
if we had a desire to have a, an area for dedicated just for, for uh, bike share, scooter share. But today, we really don't have that space or, or don't want to spend the money to create the hard space and the infrastructure that goes with that. We can still have that area available, but have them intentionally designed so that if there was funding available or we come in under budget, um, then you can expand into that space and make it so that you can, can do that. Even aspects of you know, whatever the, the final design of the building will be, there could be elements of that size-wise, what's included, what's not included, that can be designed in a way that today we are just not going to build this, but we can add that later. So these are things that I think we are going to see in this market um, until things stabilize globally in the, uh, the, the, just the, the marketplace. Uh, agencies are going to have to take that, that approach, have some flexibility and adaptability in their design. Um, and, and be creative also in, in that. Um, and I see that Ryan has his hand raised as well. He may have some uh, additional details on that. Devin Gropper, just a couple other comments on this. You know, one of, the, one of the ways to manage risk around cost is also to include appropriate contingencies um, with those cost estimates. But at the conceptual design level, there's a quite high contingency to account for all that uncertainty. We're also looking with our cost of est estimates with at an inflation adjustment as well to try to really understand, you know, what is the the, the, the likely universe of cost, right? So that we're certainly not undershooting it. Um, and that those costs will be honed as the design process moves forward. And, you know, a year or 18 months from now, when we're at the, the, the projects at final design, you know, those costs will be based on the latest and greatest uh, unit prices from recent construction projects to give the agency uh, the best confidence possible. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention just briefly, in, in addition to the, uh, kind of building on the scalable notion, is that there's also ways uh, during the bidding and construction process that the agency can manage that risk as well, right? For example, that the agency could structure the bid so that certain elements of the facility are uh, individually costed so that when the bids come in, the agency could essentially pick and choose which elements to fund based on how those bids come in. So there's flexibility there too. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I, I would definitely encourage staff to pursue such a flexible <laughs> plan. That seems um, that seems wise given our our circumstances. And then the final issue that I wanted to touch on was the poor connectivity um, in this part of town and the difficulty of serving a people well with transit in areas that have poor grid connectivity. Um, you know, you could, could be a quarter mile from the South Salem Transit Center as the crow flies, but have to walk three quarters of a mile to get there, um, given the kind of like cul-de-sac and wandering development pattern that South Salem has been shaped by. But I do think there's an opportunity there. Um, maybe it's for the board, maybe it's for staff. Um, I'll, I'll look for recommendations from uh, district leadership on this, but as the city of Salem updates its comprehensive plan, which by the way, thank you so much for consulting with them and having the forethought to think about future zoning changes along this corridor in the space of this project. Um, but as the city of Salem updates its comprehensive plan, it will have to update its transportation system plan to agree with the comprehensive plan changes that are being hopefully adopted through the R Salem project. And I think that's an opportunity um, for the city of Salem to rethink the way that they offer in particular pedestrian and bicycle connectivity through some of these areas that are currently disconnected. Um, it doesn't take a lot of land appropriation to cut a bike lane through um, or a pedestrian corridor uh, through. It's not a road um, and there could be some some real gains in terms of how well we are able to serve this part of 
our city and this part of our community, if we are able to take some steps to heal the grid in that regard, if you will. Um, and so I just wanted to bring up number one, the challenge related to connectivity in this part of our city. Um, and two, kind of a possibility that we might be in well-placed to look for solutions timing-wise. Thank you. Thank you, Director Carney. Other questions? Director Duncan. Thank you. I know that this is a, a long agenda item, so I appreciate your, your patience through all of this. Um, I appreciate that we're talking so much about the difficulties of connectivity in South Salem because there are, there are many. Um, and I appreciate emphasizing how we really need to connect to Lancaster and that part of Salem, but we also have an extensive commute over to West Salem and some other places as well. Um, West Salem comes to mind in particular because they have their own transit center. Um, and so I was wondering if there is thought or talk about how to better connect the transit centers to each other. I do know that right now pretty much there is not a way to go directly from South Salem to West without a transfer, unless you get lucky to be on the bus that turns into a different line when you go the other way, which I've done before, but is always a happy accident. Um, and since there is no park and ride in that area, it's just, it's a little tricky. So I was wondering if that, if there's been any talk of better ways to connect the new transit centers. I think that that is actually something, Director Duncan, that when we get into more of the nuances of how we provide service and how we adjust what we are uh, providing now into what it really needs to be, it will certainly look beyond just South Salem. It'll, it'll consider the comprehensive aspects of how it functions and flows with all of our service. And I'm sure Chris and his team will be taking uh, deep in depth looks at that and also do, utilizing their, um, their input from the public and origin and destination surveys and so on to really take a look at that. And that'll be all part of that process. I'll put a little pin in it for later. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, this question I think is for Mr. Farncombe. Um, you mentioned that the prototypical design of a, the Transit Center Mobility Hub was about 3.5 acres. I do not think in acres and my, my thumbs weren't able to do the one inch to 60 feet conversion well enough. Could you, if you have this data at hand, could you give me a sense of what, you know, number eight, how big that lot is? Yeah, that lot is closer to five acres. Okay, yes. fantastic. Yeah. I was gonna say it's just, just over five acres, yeah. Okay, so then my, my follow-up would be um, a new piece of jargon that I learned was DBH, which is diameter at breast height of the size of a I, I think in particular white oak, but perhaps all trees. Um, so on the, on the mock-up of the Wiltsey site, so eight, um, there's the orange trees. I am assuming those are the ones that are under the 20 inch DBH. Okay, and then the black ones are the ones that are above that, in which case Salem City Code preempts us from removing them yes that's so we are we sent our biologist out there to actually measure the trees okay. um and so then we did uh adjust the concept design so that it assumes we're not touching any of those trees that are protected out of the ordinance got it thank you and then um sp speaking about city code and land use i i couldn't find it again in the report but there was a mention about how the locations, the possible locations here uh, needed to be zoned for local ground transportation, I, I think might have been the use. Um, I know you mentioned that there was extensive conversations with the city. Was there any interest on the city's part of opening it up to those full, I think, 1,200 parcels or 12,000 parcels in that area of, that we were initially studying? Uh, that's a good question. I don't recall our, our, our conversation was pretty focused on the sites of interest and so we we essentially talked with the city you know what is where is the zoning going in this area of interest we're looking at the the exact use title i think is changing a little bit um but uh, the long and the short of it is at least for the sites we're talking about here under the the zoning code updates they would be an outright allowed a transit center would be an outright allowed use um 
but I can't speak to uh, the, ex the ex expansion of that uh, allowance elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Um, and then one last question related to this. So you, obviously that we are looking at three sites for the South Salem Transit Center Mobility Hub. Are super stops dead at this point? Is that a different selection process? Um, help, help me understand where super stops fit in this ongoing process. So President Davidson, uh, super stops are definitely not dead. Okay. So they will become a key and useful element once we have gone through the process of analyzing how we would redesign service. Where a super stop comes into play is where we have two or more routes that have a closely timed connection that would be ideally served through an enhanced or better uh, location for transfers to take place. We won't know exactly where those are until our planning department has had the opportunity to say, okay, now that we have this new anchor and we want to redesign things, how are those intersecting points going to coordinate and coincide? And does that work then to add a super stop? But we wanted to include the concept of super stops in the study because it does create a, a better and more complete ability to, to do miniature versions of that connectivity in other locations. And so that is something that we wanted to include, especially the conceptual design, so people have an understanding of what that means. But where they're located is yet to be determined because we don't want to just sure. nail those down to existing routes when those routes most likely, at least to some degree, will change. Okay, thank you, that is helpful. And then, oh, Mr. French. Yes, President Davidson, I, w I would also say along with that, I, as we're looking at it, we have some areas in mind that super stops would would probably uh, be valuable to have um, out on the skyline around Kaiser Permanente area as we redesign and look at how we connect those neighborhoods and have the right now the route eight and 18 have a way to have something that went into the neighborhoods and connected over to commercial and then in the uh, uh, south lancaster area we're not sure exactly how that lays out somewhere around possibly the winco uh, ricky and lancaster or out in the mill city or mill creek uh, business district so those are things that we're we're thinking about with kind of conceptual so they're definitely not dead they're just not at a point where we have enough data and enough design done to really pinpoint. Great, thank you very much. Director Carney and then Director Duncan. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, I appreciate you bringing up the super stops in my mind. That was part of the like build it when we can afford it phasing. Uh, you know, like maybe it would start out as a super stop, but when we get a chance, we'll add this building and this bike facility over here. Um, so I really appreciate the clarification from from staff. And also on the uh, on the parcel size, um, I also don't think in acres, but by way of comparison, maybe um, staff could remind us how big the Kaiser Transit Center site is was kaiser transit center is approximately three acres but keep in mind it's an a uh, rather odd shaped three acres so it had some limitations of because of access and its shape of the size that we needed and how we had to configure and design it yeah they sure did um and so i'm sitting on a city block in the grant neighborhood this is maybe like two acres that about right just so that I have my head in the right place when I'm trying to transport and think about the, the scale of this development maybe nobody it, knows it, it, it's difficult because city blocks are not necessarily consistent in in size and then it's easy to kind of misjudge because of the size of lots of different developments are um, it's probably the easiest is to, if you were to look at, uh, do an aerial picture of the of the site eight, and then look for something that's of similar size to a store that you have gone to before. It might give you a better idea conceptually of okay. of that size. 
fair. Yeah, that's helpful. Okay, thanks. Yeah. This is perhaps a poor comparison, but uh, a football field is about one acre. So huh. that is actually really football fields ish. Yeah, no, I think that most people can can at least visualize in their mind, you know, the minimum area that we're thinking we would need um, by saying a football field. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you, President Davidson. So mine's a, a bit of a comment more than anything else. Um, I know that we're still waiting to find what our, 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 our favorite of the options is. Um, but let's see, site D. Um, I just, a little comment from South Salem. I am concerned a bit that that might be a bit of an unpopular choice just simply because it cuts in half the food cart pod that's in that area, which is very popular in the area and always is completely parked up. Um, and I don't think that the people that are driving to that would necessarily be our target demographic to <laughs> switch to bus driving um, individuals or bus riding individuals. Um, so that's, and I, I appreciate that we are going to try to, to keep um, some of the cart, some of the pods in that, but that is just a, a little concern from the, the maybe PR side of things for that particular design. Important details and many more like that for next month's conversation. Sorry, thank yes. you. <laughs> okay, any other questions? I have one last curiosity. Why the alphanumeric system? It, do, do the numbers mean something and the letters mean something else? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so the, there was, during the, the evaluation process, we looked at individual sites, so large single property owner sites, and also assemblages of parcels that could meet the needs. And so we ended up with the numerals and letters, basically, from, from that analysis. Got it, thank you. Yeah, so the letters are com com combinations of multiple parcels, whereas eight is one single parcel. Got it, okay. If there's no other questions, would someone like to make a motion? I move the board accept the South Salem Transit Center Mobility Hub Site Selection Study Final Report, that is a mouthful, and approve the recommendation of the sites identified in the report as finalist sites to proceed with the required steps for property acquisition. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the item? I just want to... <laughs> what was that, Director Carney? I said I can't wait for next month. Yeah. Uh, thank you for all the hard work going into this. And uh, I will just plant an idea that I would love to see if option eight, for example, happens to go forward. Uh, the city of Salem is looking to locate a South Salem library with affordable housing. And it would be, if a five acre plot is as big as I think it is, we might be able to co-locate, have some transit oriented development there. So want to put that out into the ether. Um, <laughs> And if there's no other discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, none opposed, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, I will go ahead and now open the budget hearing and we'll go ahead and proceed to um, the public comment portion of the budget hearing. But first I'd like to invite uh, budget committee chair, Kathy Lincoln to make some remarks. Um, thank you, uh, President Davidson and members of the board. And I'm sorry I'm not there with you in person, but I do appreciate the opportunity to present to you the Budget Committee's recommendation to adopt the fiscal year 2022-23 budget for the Salem Area Mass Transit District. The Budget Committee is composed of the Board of Directors of Chariots and a member of the community from each board member's district as required by statute. The committee met on May 5th to review the proposed budget. And uh, many thanks to General Manager Alan Pollack and the Chariot staff for all their hard work in preparing the budget and reviewing it with, uh, with us. The committee voted unanimously to approve the proposed budget for the 2022-2023 fiscal year in the amount of $142,325,113 and approved taxes at a rate of $0.7609 per $1,000 of assessed value for operating purposes in the general fund. 
The budget um, has appropriated funds of $102,846,779 and a reserve fund of $50,011,719. This will allow transit service to increase as anticipated following the slowdown caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. New revenues are included in the budget from federal and state sources that addressed increased expenses which were necessary to maintain service and the safety of passengers and employees during the and after the COVID-19 pandemic. It also includes federal, several federal grants specifically aimed at providing low and no emission vehicles. The budget anticipates moving to 100% service level by September 2022. It also will fund a new electric corridor with zero emission electric buses, implementation of a new uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion plan, various software upgrades, including electronic fare payment systems, completion of a contract with the Amalgamated Transit Union, and continuation of the South Salem Mobility Hub project, which we just heard a tremendous report about, among other goals. Chariots is moving forward on a strong financial basis. The Salem Area Mass Transit District will be able to continue to provide excellent customer service throughout the district in the coming years. We all appreciate your commitment and hard work. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of the budget process. Thank you, Chair Lincoln. I will go ahead and open it up to members of the public if they'd like to provide comment on the budget. Not seeing any members of the public present in our location um, coming up to make public comment and there are none online um, stepping up to provide public comment. So I will go ahead and close the budget hearing and go ahead and turn our attention to the deliberation of budget hearing. And so if someone would like to make a motion. I move that the board adopt resolution number 2022-04 to adopt the FY 2022-23 budget, making appropriations and imposing and categorizing taxes. I second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing no discussion, all those in, oh, Director Carney. I just wanted to say thank you to our budget chair, Kathy Lincoln, uh, for presenting this evening and for her service to the budget committee. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. And I would like to second that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you so much, Kathy. Um, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, motion passes unanimously. We'll go ahead and... Um, proceed to the next portion of our agenda, which is the approval of contract for Del Webb Security Services. Oh, excuse me. I'll ask uh, Karen Garcia to come back up to present the report. Good evening again, President Davidson and members of the board. Shall the board authorize the general manager to execute a contract extension with DePaul Industries, the DPI group for security services unarmed to begin July 1, 2022 for a not to exceed amount of $260,000. Um, as you all know, the brand promise for Chariots is to provide a world-class customer experience. It's very important to us that we can provide a safe and secure environment for our employees, riders, and members of the general public. We partner with the City of Salem through an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with the Police Department, and then we also have a contract for private security services with Allied Universal Security. Um, we uh, partner with them to provide that support at the transit centers, both at the Kaiser Transit Center and here at the Downtown Transit Center. At the Del Webb Operations Headquarters, we house our entire operations division as well as some additional staff for support. Um, that group includes the Transportation Department, Maintenance Department, and Contracted Services Department. Um, along with those staff, we have a significant number of material assets to include a number of our revenue and non-revenue vehicles, and a, a lot of technology is also housed at that facility. 
So in July of 2021, we contracted with the DPI group to provide security at that site. Uh, we were having a number of unauthorized entries onto the facility. Um, so we wanted to ensure the safety of our employees and other folks that come to that property. So um, adding that security would help us reduce risk to the district and improve safety for all, as well as um, provide a presence so that the community understands that security and safety for our facilities and personnel is an important part of what we do here at Chariots. There is a capital project that we began in fiscal year 22 to secure that facility and harden the perimeter. It includes automated gates and um, an improved fence line. Um, we are still in the planning process of that project, but it is moving forward. But it does take time when you do a large project like that. So in the interim, because the gates are open during all of our hours of operation, um, we are vulnerable without a security presence there. So that is the reason that we um, contracted with DPI last year to provide that security presence. So the goal tonight is to um, execute an extension of that contract for fiscal year 2022 and 2023 um, to have a security staff on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, the budget for this project was included in the fiscal year 22-23 general funds budget for a cost not to exceed $260,000. So staff recommends that the board authorize the general manager to execute a contract extension with DePaul Industries, the DPI group, for security services unarmed at the Dell Web Operations Headquarters for a not to exceed amount of $260,000. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you, any questions? Director Carney. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, while not related to this, contract extension. Um, I'm curious about the perimeter hardening and the schedule upon which we might complete that project. Director Carney, we're at the beginning phases of that. We're working with a contractor that we have um, to help with the planning phase and do a very high level initial cost estimate. After we complete that phase, we'll be moving on to design, architectural and engineering design because we do have a lot of work to do on that property. After we solidify the design work and have a firmer uh, cost estimate, then we'll be moving forward with a construction um, scope of work and solicitation to actually do the work. Thank you. Um, I, I wonder, I mean, just given the supply chain and um, cost of <laughs> goods these days, um, how it may make more sense to continue extending this contract than to complete that work for a while until costs come down. But I guess we will make that decision um, when it is ours to make, because tonight we're talking about this contract. So thank you. You're welcome. Other questions, please. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, so seeing that we have a memorandum of understanding with the city of Salem's police department, is there a reason that we don't have a, um, the same MOU with the Kaiser police department for the Kaiser transit center? That is a great question, director. Um, we have had a long standing agreement with the city of Salem for police services many, many years ago before we had private security contractors here, the police department actually provided our security presence at the downtown transit center. This was well before the Kaiser transit center was even in existence. After we built the Kaiser Transit Center and opened it, we established a relationship with Kaiser Police Department, which we have a great relationship with them today. They do respond to that site and provide great support to us. We don't have the number of incidents there because we don't serve the same number of people there and we don't have the same uh, amount of volume and routes at that location. So it's not as significant of a need but if that situation changes, I think it would be great for us to work to more formalize our relationship with Kaiser Police Department, as well as Mary County Sheriff's Department, actually, because although we don't have a transit center in their jurisdiction, we do have a lot of transit service in the Sheriff's Department jurisdiction, and so it's, we do a lot of work with them. So to formalize that agreement would be something we could possibly consider down the road as well. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Okay, seeing no other questions, um, would someone like to make the motion? 
I move that the board authorize the general manager to execute a contract extension with DePaul Industries, the DPI group for security services unarmed at the Dell Webb Operations Headquarters for a not to exceed amount of $260,000. I second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Okay. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion or any opposed? No, okay. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next up is the approval of, of contract for financial audit services. All right, I'll ask Denise LaRue, our CFO, to please present the report. Good evening, President Davidson and members of the board. The current audit services contract ends on July 30th of this year. Therefore, we have, an, we have issued an RFP for a contract for two years with three one-year extensions. Grove, Mueller, and Swank was selected for the next contract period. The cost, including all extension years, would be $399,500. Staff recommends the board authorize the general manager to enter into a contract with Grove, Mueller, and Swank for the delivery of audit services for a total cost not to exceed $399,500. Are there any questions? Any questions? Director Carney. Sorry, I'm muted. Um, and apologies for being off camera. I don't think anybody wants to watch me chew. Um, why do we need an auditor? Are we required? Yes, we are. To be audited? Yes, annually. And who's requiring us? Who, I'm sorry? I who is it, who, from where does the requirement come? Is it federal or? Oh, the requirement is, is state but i believe it's okay it would be federal also okay through, okay through our fta requirements okay i was just curious thank you mm -hmm. other questions okay seeing no further questions um would someone like to make a motion I move that the board authorize the general manager to enter into a contract with Grove, Miller, and Swank PC for the delivery of audit services for a total cost not to exceed $399,500. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? I would just like to note that I think we maybe read the final sum incorrectly. So I would amend the motion to a cost not to exceed $399,500 thousand five hundred dollars thank you do you accept the amendment i do thank you director okay so <laughs> i'm going to consider that a friendly amendment to the motion uh any further discussion okay all those in favor please say aye aye aye, aye. 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 actually did you want to second that friendly amendment? and i'll second that yes, that you. friendly uh, amendment. i'm going to call the vote again I, I was not paying attention all those in favor please say aye Aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Well, um, next on our agenda is the general manager's report. Great, thank you, and I do have a, a few items to report. First, uh, I, I think it's appropriate to start, and I've provided you information in this in previous emails, uh, but I'd like to address the, the loss of uh, uh, a long-time uh, important member of the Oregon Transit community. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Doug Pilant, who's the executive director for Tillamook County Transportation District, passed away uh, after a, a strong fight of a reoccurrence of cancer. Uh, uh, Doug has been in Oregon's transit community for many years, starting at uh, Rogue Valley Transportation District. Uh, for a short while, he was a member of Team Chariots and worked here. And when I came here 15 years ago, he was the executive director of Oregon Housing and Associated Services, who was the uh, contracted services provider uh, for our paratransit and regional service, uh, and was actually the original 
paratransit service provider for, for chariots. Uh, you know, Doug was uh, always uh, was had a, a friendly smile. It was it was a very kind person. You could see his passion in taking care of his customers, and uh, uh, he will be a loss to the Oregon transit community. Uh, next up, uh, so earlier today, uh, there's lots going back on back in Washington D.C. If you're following the news, uh, but they are doing other business besides. Uh, hearings and earlier today uh, the house transportation housing and urban development uh, with commonly known as T-HUD uh, the appropriations subcommittee met today and marked up its draft fiscal year 2023 T-HUD appropriations bill uh, and the full committee is scheduled to mark up the bill uh, next week uh, the Senate uh, uh, has not uh, uh, announced or introduced uh, when they are going to address their version of the bill. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, the, the bill uh, has marked up today fully funds public transit uh, uh, authorizations in line with the IIJA. Uh, in fact, public transit appropriations exceeded the I, IIJA's levels of fiscal year 23, uh, specifically $21.7 billion for public transit next year which is a 6% increase from this year. Uh, and actually, uh, the bill, as it relates specifically to bus agencies, provided uh, an extra $200 million to the 5339B, which is the bus and bus facility competitive grant program that we compete in each year. They also added an additional $75 million more to the 5339C, which is the low and no emissions competitive grant program, uh, bringing uh, 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 the IIJA uh, funds $1.9 billion in plus ups uh, that we've fought as a member of uh, various coalitions since 2018. In addition to that, uh, they also included in the bill policy language that would allow public transit agencies to treat fuel for vehicle operations as associated capital maintenance. Uh, so what does that mean to us? It means it opens up access to 5307 federal funds to allow us to pay for fuel and maybe reallocate our general funds elsewhere. Uh, but we'll take a look at that if and when, or when the uh, uh, final appropriations bills pass. Uh, just so you know, it will, uh, uh, go to the full markup next week. The Senate does their version, then the two bodies conference it, and then ultimately there's a final bill that will go to the president's. Um, some good news in that is that uh, as part of the markup report that was released this afternoon, uh, I am pleased to say that uh, our South Salem uh, congressionally directed spending of 2.5 million dollars for South Salem was included in the, the final markup. Uh, still a long way to go. As I said, it's still the Senate needs to do their work and we still need to conference, but uh, uh, it gets us to the next step in the process. So uh, more to come on that. And we were notified about that today from our federal uh, representatives at CFM uh, on that. Uh, and as you know, uh, gas prices are rather high. Uh, and one of the potential solutions to bring gas prices down is to uh, impose a gas tax holiday. So, uh, I can tell you that APTA, the American Public Transportation Association, our national trade association along with 30 other coalition partners uh, has written a letter to President Biden saying we oppose the gas tax holiday. Uh, so the important part for us is if that gas tax holiday is imposed, that reduces the federal highway gas tax, which ultimately a portion of that comes to the uh, uh, to public transit. And so we would either lose that revenue or it had to be diverted from some other source. So uh, more to come on that, but just to let you know, lots of things happening in D.C., uh, lots of good things for chariots. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to share, I'm actually going to ask uh, our Director of Communication, Patricia Feeney, to share some news uh, with the board. Thank you, General Manager. 
President Davidson. Earlier this month, we did receive some exciting celebratory news. We have won a first place AdWill Award from APTA. This is for the 2022 annual Ad AdWill Awards um, in the competition for marketing communication. We won in the category of best marketing and communication educational initiative, social media. This is for our video that we made. Uh, it's the Chariots Road Equity video um, called Share the Road. This is the one that featured the big orange puppet that either delights or scares you, just depending on who you are. Um, our win will appear in Passenger Transport, which is APTA's magazine, on social media and in a news release. And then this summer, there's a second round of judging where the first place winners will be looked at and they will either be passed over or they'll win a grand award. And if you remember last year, we did win a grand award for the customer education campaign. And so thank you, General Manager, for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Great, that's wonderful news. Yes, excellent. Okay. That uh, concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and proceed to the Board of Director reports and um, with Director Wynn out this evening, Director Navarro, could you kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, President Davidson. So I was unfortunately unable to make the, the Kaiser Chamber Forum this month. I caught COVID earlier and it was crippling. And uh, wow, so I would definitely recommend everybody stay up to date on your boosters because it would most likely make a difference. Um, once I recovered though, I was able to um, be honored with the opportunity to present an award to Councilor Roland Herrera at the Kaiser City Council for his dedication to inclusivity in the city of Kaiser. So that was really exciting uh, to be able to honor him for um, the many years that he's been an advocate for uh, people who felt disenfranchised uh, in, the community, in the community of Kaiser. Um, I was also uh, brought aware of a ground, uh, groundbreaking event just a few blocks over at the YMCA Veterans Shelter um, that they're gonna start building here. Uh, so I'm really excited about them bringing affordable housing for veterans to the community and it being so close to, Kaiser, uh, to um, Chariots and looking forward to a partnership there to support them in that. Uh, speaking of, of uh, veterans, uh, I hope you all will join me in sending well wishes to Mark Connect, who is a volunteer on our Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, he is in the hospital right now. Um, he is recovering from uh, some, some illness, but he's recovering. So I hope you guys will join me in, in wishing him well and, and a fast and speedy recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Director Navarro. Director Carney. Thank you, President Davidson. Oh, that's sad news about Mark Connect. He is a real presence. He has been a fixture in the, the chariots uh, kind of transit community for a long time. Um, speaking of which, I didn't maybe catch the beginning of um, our public commenters intro, but John Hamill, um, and I think Director Navarro knows this, serves on our STIF Act uh committee if our or our stiff advisory committee if i'm not mistaken and as a former member and maybe a current member i'm not sure on our citizen advisory committee and a former board member am i correct alan mm -hmm. yeah so that guy is amazing and the advocacy that he does for um our disabled community and our our low and no vision community is really astounding so i was glad to see him here tonight um I wanted to say thank you to uh, Chariot staff for a great board retreat. Uh, that was a lot of fun to see everybody and I thought a really productive time. Um, and also huge kudos and congrats to Patricia Feeney and the marketing team for another AdWheel award. This is blowing my mind mm -hmm. that Salem is, is kind of like making the news and on the map for all of these amazing reasons. Um, and I just, I, I can't, I can't wait to see what's next for, for transit and for Salem. Um, we're just kind of rising stars around here. Uh, so a couple updates on my committee assignments. Our SCATS policy committee does not meet um, until next week. So this is one of those odd months where it falls a little bit out of order. So uh, more than likely I'll have lots to update you on. Um, I did have a constituent reach out regarding the policy committee agenda that is forthcoming. 
um, or that's coming up next Tuesday about um, we are reconsidering some of our transportation improvement program items as a result of cost overruns, in particular fuel, um, as we are met with kind of these supply chain issues and, um, you know, as Alan noted, the rising fuel costs. And so it is having, uh, you know, an impact on the transportation improvements that will that we will be able to plan for and realize. And I will report to the board next month um, as I know more about that. Uh, and finally, the, the Our Salem, City of Salem Comprehensive Plan has come up a number of times in our meeting tonight. And I wanted to let folks know that our city council will be deliberating on the Our Salem Comprehensive Plan update on July 11th. This is their second hearing. So um, it's possible it could be uh, adopted, I believe, at this point. Um, and that is exciting news. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Director Carney. Director Enojos Pressy. Uh, thank you, President Davidson. Um, since Director Wynn isn't here, I figured um, I'd give the board the update on the DEI committee, because I know that a lot of work has gone into this. Um, and so since the last report, um, Keene submitted a procurement appendix for staff review. They've completed most project tasks and are fi finalizing draft strategic plan for staff and board subcommittee review. Uh, they are to meet with the executive leadership team on July 1 to review fin findings. And the subcommittee will meet early July 7th to review the draft plan. And they'll present the final DEI strategic plan at the July 28th board meeting, as uh, we heard earlier. And um, yeah, this week was the Citizens Advisory Committee meeting. Um, I think this is the first time that I've had a committee meeting so close to the board meeting. Um, so it always a pleasure <laughs> to be on that committee. Um, they received some updates from staff, uh, reports on quarterly performance statistics, and the ridership survey, uh, which was a little bit of some time coming that I think, I think the, the committee members were pretty excited to, to get the results. Um, there was also an update on the long range transit plan project that mentioned some you know, modeling on route adjustments that I think are very interesting and I would love to get to hear a little bit more in depth. Um, and I, you know, it's just top of mind considering like all the talk we just had about like the South Salem uh, Mobility Hub project. Uh, maintenance staff gave a briefing on charging infrastructure at Dell Webb. And speaking of Dell Webb, the committee is also very excited to get a tour of the facility. And it was also discussed about whether or not we would be coming back to in-person meetings. And the decision was to have uh, hybrid meetings moving forward, similar to the way that the board has been operating. Um, and hopefully with that first hi hybrid meeting being in August to include a tour of Dell Webb. And the work plan will be addressed and assignments made to ensure work begins. Um, so aside from just having a great time on the committee, I also get to see Tom for <laughs> a little more than I usually get to. Um, and then I think just of note is that we are supposed to have kind of a hot weekend. So for folks to make sure to stay cool. And I know recently the OSHA heat rules went into effect. Um, I know those are kind of uh, up in the air right now with the lawsuit, but just wanted to um, make sure that folks are um, taking ample breaks and drinking cool water and make sure that they're staying safe in the heat. So that concludes my report. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm up next and so, um, 
MWACT occurred earlier this month. I was unable to attend, though I've uh, secured a recording of it, um, so I'll watch that at a later date. But the big discussion item is, or was, the project, um, they've since renamed it. I don't remember what they've renamed it, but it's the Highway 2251 interchange. Um, so they've renamed it because it's more than just that interchange. Um, but it's that stretch of Highway 22. And um, among the things they discussed or, or presented were um, different models of what that might look like in, with the inclusion of, I mean, they would, they would make it a, a genuine highway with limited egress options. And so there would be frontage roads. And so it would really change the dynamic of things. Um, they're doing it in the name of safety. Um, there are a lot of um, details yet to be worked out though. So wanted to just flag that. And then um, Director Hinojos Pressi and I, we attended the Council of Governments meeting, I in this capacity and she in her capacity as a school board member. And uh, that occurred earlier this week and we approved our, the annual budget like we did uh, tonight. Um, a few things I wanted to flag there though was that um, the Council of Governments continued work on the St. Am Canyon recovery. Um, so they've, uh, been strong partners with Marion County and the, those um, small municipal jurisdictions up the canyon that have been impacted by the wildfires. And so um, they've dedicated staff resources, significant staff resources towards the rebuilding there. And so um, that will continue. Um, they also announced their new community development director. Um, her background uh, actually immediately preceding this position was the head of the Safe Routes to School um, division or section within the Council of Governments. And so she's very passionate and knowledgeable about alternative transportation, including public transit. And so I think uh, it's a wonderful hire, uh, both for the Council of Governments and also our region at large. And then um, at the Legislative Committee for the Council of Governments, we've continued our discussions around um, policy areas and discussions and how we as a region fall in line on what are our policy goals going into this upcoming legislative session, but also moving forward. And um, one of the items, and I, I believe I've mentioned this in the past, is that we want to address is regional transit. And so uh, General Manager Pollock is assisting me in drafting a one-pager document that the Council of Government's Legislative Committee will review and hopefully adopt as part of their legislative package. And then as part of the, our legislative efforts, this summer we will have a, I'm sure there's a better name for this, but a meet and greet meeting uh, with would-be candidates and elected officials so they can meet with elected and appointed officials from our region and hear what matters most to us. And so um, in recent years, the Council of Governments has made great efforts to speak with one voice uh, for the Marion, Polk, and Yamhill County um, region. And so working on continuing uh, that dialogue with um, particularly um, the new Congress people that we'll have in Congressional District 5 and 6, and then also um, there will be a lot of turnover in the Legislative Assembly, so all of those individuals. Um, the other thing I wanted to update you all on is, and this ties back to the United Way bus passes, which I promised I would get back to, but um, uh, last year I, uh, reached out to Director Hinojos Pressi and asked her how she felt about uh, making uh, school bus or bus passes for K through 12 students free. And I started selling her on the merits of it and then she stopped me and said, you don't need to sell me anymore, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we set about doing that. And um, so in January, in earnest, we started having conversations with the city of Salem city of Kaiser and then the school board about how we might be able to make that happen. And um, you may remember last year, I posed a question to our CFO, Denise LaRue, asking what the cost was for um, youth bus passes. What is the revenue that we generate from our current youth bus passes at 50 cent a ride? And she provided that information to me and then we were able to begin having those conversations with our peer governments. And I'm happy to report that on June 6, the Kaiser City Council unanimously included $30,000 in their budget for a one-year pilot project to bring back zero fare bus passes for K-12 students. And 
Uh, details still are yet to be worked out, um, but it would be a one-year pilot project. This would be the first time in over a decade that we could restart this program. Uh, it ended in 2011 with the conclusion or, or sunsetting of the business energy tax credit. And um, I'll just share one anecdote from the Kaiser City Council meeting that I attended and presented at. They, um, one counselor explained, uh, after answering, asking a few questions, explained that she normally would not be supportive of this, but that her child benefited back when this program existed over a decade ago. And for that reason, she would be voting yes for it. Um, so the Kaiser City Council unanimously appropriated that, those funds. Their budget has been finalized. The week following, Mayor-elect Chris Hoy um, made an amendment to the budget appropriating, or I guess it's not yet official, but amended their budget for future consideration to include $150,000 to bring K through 12 bus passes. And then um, the school district is continuing to work and I think dot those I's and cross those T's, but I'm optimistic that they too will uh, be able to appropriate the $150,000. And with that $330,000 in total, we'll cover the lost revenue in uh, f to institute a pilot project this fall for K through 12 students, whether it's public, private, or homeschool students to be able to travel uh, to where they need to go. Um, as I stated to the Kaiser City Council, after school, or after school activity participation is highly correlated with higher graduation rates. And so um, being able to attend after school activities, whether that's a club, a sporting event, or any other kind of activity, uh, is I think we will see all kinds of benefits um, beyond just the freedom of mobility. Um, and so uh, a lot of work yet to be done, but I wanted to share the happy news now. Um, uh, of course, the, the real work that Alan and many others uh, will have to figure out what this looks like. Um, but I wanted to share that with you. Uh, I think speaking for myself and Director Eno Hespressi, uh, we were hesitant to kind of make this public because uh, at any point it didn't look like it m might work. So I'm very happy to say that it looks like it will work um, and more details to come, but we're looking for a fall start date with that. So, um, and I think I need to ask for concurrence to do a fair evaluation on that. No? No. no. Okay. Great. Um, so with that, that concludes my director report. Director Duncan. Uh, thank you, President Davidson. So uh, I covered a lot of what I was already going to talk about as we were talking about the South Salem Transit Center, um, some of the new developments in, in my part of town. Uh, unfortunately, I did not make it to SEDCOR this, uh, this week. There was uh, Make Music Day was the same day, and I ended up unexpectedly working that day, although I cannot say that I regret it at all. Um, having the time in the community, I think, was incredibly valuable. It was so wonderful to see so many people, families, and uh, community members, not just downtown, but in all different parts of Salem, uh, taking part and musicians on every street corner. And I have never been part of Make Music Day before, which is apparently a large part of Salem history. And I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to be, I was over at um, the, the old Mission Mill. That was fantastic. Uh, this is my little plug to remind everyone that uh, it is about to be July. And, um, you know, be careful with those fireworks. It's been really nice that we've